In this lesson, we'll explore absolute versus relative file referencing. The concept is best illustrated with an example. In our last exercise, we inserted a video into our HTML page. We did so using the video element, which required a source attribute. We've worked with the source attribute when inserting images as well. The source attribute requires that we specify the source location and name of the file we want to insert into our document. Since the files we've inserted to this point are in the same folder as the HTML file, we've only had to specify a file name, for example, ya.mp4. This is an example of relative file referencing. The path of the file is defined relative to its directory. Now say for example we wanted to insert an image into this document from an external source. For example, another website altogether. For that we need to use absolute file referencing. An absolute file path requires that we include the complete address of the file as shown in this block of code that I'm about to insert. Here we've included a JPEG file from an external website planwallpaper.com. The full URL to the file is required for the image to be displayed because it's from an external source. So now if I refresh the page, we can see that the image is outputted in our web browser. Here's the URL to the image and you can see that it's displayed in the browser when we access it. And so that's all there is to it when it comes to relative versus absolute file referencing. In this lecture, we're going to explore link creation within our HTML document. We'll be creating both text links as well as image links. Let's start with adding a link on the images we inserted in the last lecture. We'll link each vacation picture to a relevant website. To do so, we'll be using the A tags. Add the following code around your first image. We'll start with the opening A tag, followed by the href attribute. And this attribute specifies where this image will link to. And we have to include the complete URL. In this case, we're going to have it linked to miami.com. Be very careful not to make any typos in the URL, otherwise the link will not work. And that's it for the, the first link. You'll notice that the closing A tag and the opening A tag do encompass the image tag and the image attributes. So the link must encompass the entire image from the, from the opening tags to the closing. And let's just go ahead and apply a few other links as well to the other images. Now I'll just copy and paste this code to save time and I'll change the link source. And now that I have all my links created and attached to the images, I'll go ahead and save my file and preview this in the web browser to make sure that all the links do work. So right away when I hover my mouse over these images, I can tell that a link is attached to the image because the cursor changes. Let's just go ahead and click on each one to make sure that the links do work. So it appears that each link does work and that's how you apply links to images. Now let's go ahead and create textual links.
Now the process of adding links to text is identical, but first we have to create a few lines of text to apply links to. So let's go ahead and create a new paragraph. And then just type some text. Now we'll just indent this text. And now we can begin adding the text links. We we'll use the same links that we used last time because we know they work. You can just copy and paste uh, from the other links we we created. Okay, so now that we have our links applied, we can go ahead and just save the file. We'll test one of them just to make sure it works. I'm sure you get the idea. So we can see our list there. And we'll just click on florida.com. And it does go to the miami.com website. Now one thing you'll notice is when I clicked on the link, it opened the link in the same browser window as our original page. A lot of times what you might need to do is open open the link in a new browser window so then that way the original window doesn't close and the viewer can very easily revert back to it. And in order to do that we need to add a target attribute to our A tag. So the target attribute looks like this. And to specify that we want this page to open in a new browser window, you put an underscore and type blank within the quotations. And that'll open in a new blank window. That's what that means. So just copy and paste that attribute into the other links. and then save your file and preview it in the browser. Okay, so now we can see that the link opens in a separate browser window. And it's very a lot more convenient to switch back to our original page without having to press the back button. And it looks like each one is working and opening in a separate browser window. In the previous lecture, we explored adding links that take you to different web pages. Now we're going to work with anchor tags. Anchor tags allow us to link to a specific area of content on our existing page. Let's take a look at an example. On this page, you'll notice we have a table of contents at the top of the page that lists five articles, article one, two, three, four, and five. The idea is to have these items linked to their corresponding article on the same page. So if I click on article three, for example, you'll notice that the page navigates to the beginning of the third article in our content area. And the same goes for Article 4, and so on and so forth. In order to make this work, we need to set up an anchor that will instruct a text link on the position of the article that corresponds to the link. We've included a file called anchors.html in the Downloads folder corresponding to this lecture. You need to open this file in your text editor in order to follow along with this tutorial.
So here we have the source code for the file. And in order to make this work, we'll have to go ahead and add a few anchors on all five article headings. To add the anchor, locate the article heading and insert the following code. You'll notice that we're using the A tag with an ID attribute. Later on in this tutorial, tutorial, we're going to link to each one of these anchors from our table of contents. So once you've inserted your first named anchor, you need to insert the others in front of the other article headings. So just copy this block of code and paste it in front of each article heading. Remember to make sure you change the number of the article so it corresponds to the correct uh, article heading. Now that we've inserted the named anchors, we'll need to link to them from our table of contents. So let's scroll up to the table of contents and add the following code around each article heading. You'll notice we're using the A tags with the href attribute. One difference is that we have a number sign in front of, of the link. The number sign instructs the browser not to divert the user to a new web page when the link is clicked. When the number sign is followed by an anchor name, the page will notice search for the anchor name on the existing page. It will then retrieve the content that is defined by the anchor position. So again, let's copy this block of code and create our links for the additional article headings. Once again, remember to change the number so it corresponds to the correct article heading. So once you've added all your links, save the file and preview the page in your web browser to make sure that everything works. So now we can see that each item in the table of contents does have a link attached to it and let's just confirm that it does work so article 1 article 2 article 3 4 and 5 in this lecture we're going to be creating tables using HTML when it comes to building web pages it's very important to have a solid understanding of table structures. Tables allow us to organize data and content in an organized way. 
Table data is structured in the form of rows and columns. The intersection of a row with a column forms a table cell. The individual cells contain the actual data. Data can be in the form of text, images, or even video content. This example illustrates the structure of a basic table used to record the findings of a survey that ask respondents to list their favorite sport. Here we have a table with two columns and nine rows, which gives us 18 individual cells. Let's start off by creating this table in a standard HTML5 document. For this, you'll need to open your text editor and we'll also need to set up the basic HTML page structure as we learned in earlier lessons. Once you have the basic HTML page structure, uh, created, go ahead and save your file anywhere on your computer. You can save the file as tables.html. Make sure to put the HTML extension at the end. So by now this should all look familiar and as you probably guessed the code block for our table will be inserted between the body uh, the open and closed body tags we'll begin by adding our or our open and close table tags The table tag also has several attributes. First, we can specify the width of the table. For now, we'll put the width as 100%. We'll come back to the width attribute once we have our table created, because there are different ways the width can be stated. Next, we can set a border for our table. Let's set the border to one pixel. And you can increase this value for a thicker border, or you, could put, you can put zero for no border. We can also put a border color attribute. And we'll set that to blue. Next, we can specify the cell spacing and cell padding attributes. This illustration provides a visual illustration of what each of these mean. The cell padding will define the amount of space around the cell contents. The cell spacing, on the other hand, will determine the amount of space between each cell in your table. And the unit of measurement for cell spacing and cell padding is also a pixel. Once we've defined these attributes, we can start adding rows and columns. Each row is defined by an open and close TR tag for table row. So I'll create one row to begin with. And inside each row, 
I can create any number of columns. So our table had two columns, and a column is represented by the open and close TD tag. You can insert your content inside uh, the open and close TD tag. So the first part of our table was um, the headings. So that's that's the that's what the first row would look like. Now I'll insert the second row. And again, each row had two columns. Just enter some some data inside these columns. Made a mistake there. So remember the first column was the sport and we'll put the sport label in, in each of the first columns and then the response in each of the second columns. I'm just copying and pasting. I'm just changing the, the sport labels and also the data. And there it is. That's all the rows and columns uh, for this particular table. So with the table created, let's save this file and preview it in our web browser to see the final result. And that's what the table looks like. One thing you may have noticed is the table is the full width of the browser's content area. And this is because we specified a table width of 100%. You'll notice that if we change the size of the browser window, that the uh, table expands and contracts and always maintains 100% of the browser window. Now let's see what would happen if I change the width to 50%. So I'll go, go back to the, the source code and just change the width to 50%. And then refresh the page. Now we can see that the table always maintains 50% of the browser's content area. 
Okay, so with the percentage based width, the table will always expand and contract to maintain that percentage, the specified percentage of the browser's content area. But what if we wanted the table to be a fixed width so it doesn't expand or contract with the browser window? For that, we would need to change the width from a percentage to a fixed value. So let's go ahead and change from 50% to 500. Now, if you don't specify a percentage, that converts the table width into a pixel-based table width. So 500 pixels will be the new width of this table. So we're going to save the file. And I'm just going to reload the web browser. And now you'll notice that no matter how big or small the browser window is, the table always stays at 500 pixels.